The following podcast is brought to you by Cast Content Media. Welcome to Dixie and the King. I'm an Elvis tribute artist rocking the cradle with a much younger wife. And we are coming together to figure out this thing called life. Take this journey with us through our unique and fascinating relationship as we tackle marriage, parenting, and spirituality. We find ways to live a better life through our experiences and learn from professionals and everyday folks along the way and how to thrive in today's world. And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Dixie and the King. My name is George, and this is my beautiful wife, Dixie. Thank you so much for tuning us in. And I got to tell you, this is probably one of my most exciting podcasts I I have scheduled so far. As a matter of fact, out of the hundreds of thousands of podcasts (laughs) that we're going to do, this will probably rank as the top. But I got to tell you, but first and foremost, we want to thank castcontentmedia.com for sponsoring our podcast. And you can find us on our website, which is dixieandtheking.com. And don't forget, we are on YouTube, Spotify, and tune in. And please send me your favorite way to listen to podcasts um, because I'm really trying to branch out and get us out there. So that's right. And on our YouTube channel, the Dixie and King, uh, be sure to hit that subscribe button. So, so punch that subscribe button if you so wish. Well, without further ado, because we got this guy has so much to say and so little time to say it. As everybody knows, I'm an Elvis tribute artist, and uh, we do a, we do a, some wonderful shows. And I like to talk a little bit about Elvis's life. I don't know as much as this next guest, but we are speaking with Larry Geller, who was Elvis's personal hairstylist. Larry, it's so nice to have you. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, Dixie and George, I'm so pleased to be with you guys. And, of course, you and I have chatted before many years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm really pleased to be here. And uh, to talk, for me to talk about Elvis. Yeah. It's probably one of my deepest passions if we had four or five hours, I would just be nonstop. Because <laughs> uh, so much happened over the years. And um, no matter what happened in my life with Elvis, it was, it's like it's branded on my brain. Being wow. with him. <clears throat> was a person. <clears throat> so... I'd like to tell you how I met Elvis. Yes, it's so do. interesting. We're going to go way back in time. When I was in high school in 1957, and I became an Elvis fan overnight. I knew every lyric to every song. On the weekends, we go to parties. I would bring a little guitar, Elvis's records. I would put them on. And I would do Elvis. He would be singing. I'd be loving it. But I knew every inflection, every nuance. And one afternoon, one of the, my friends in this club I belonged to said, Elvis is coming to town. There's going to be a rock concert. Well, we never heard of that before. And we take all these things for granted today. But back then... I never. I didn't know what a rock concert was. How old were you, Larry, no. when when that I, happened? I was sixteen years old. Okay. And I was much shorter then uh, than I am now. I grew up when I was about seventeen. I just shot up, and I'm I'm six two. At mm. any rate, there's a, a in. I grew, grew up in Hollywood, California. Saw celebrity sightings all the time. Saw John Wayne and Paul Newman. That's just natural in California and Hollywood. But the thought of seeing Elvis, that was something else. Elvis was already the king back then. He was the biggest thing in show business. So he, uh, uh, there was an auditorium that's still there called the Pan Pacific. It was for boat shows and auto shows, the ice capades, that kind of uh, uh, place. That's where Elvis was going to be. So all my buddies and I 
we went to the Pan Pacific Auditorium, and all of a sudden, we're looking around, and we saw something we never saw in our lives. Thousands of kids coming in from all directions. This is mind-blowing. When you experience something like this for the very first time, everyone had tickets but us. There's about five, <laughs> six of us. And slow, everyone w- was in the auditorium. We look at each other, and all I knew was I wanted to meet Elvis. I wanted to at least see him. We went to the side of the building in the back, and we tried to pry open a door. <laughs> nothing. We went to another door. Nothing. So finally, we went to the far end of the building, and I said to my friends, I said, look, look, there he is. There's Elvis. And Elvis was standing about 20 yards away, wearing a gold lame jacket, standing in front of about four or five guys, his entourage, I said, come on, you guys, let's go, let's go meet him. And when I looked at them, they froze. (laughs) And I knew they were petrified. And I was too, really. I said, well, I'm going, you guys. And I just ran up to Elvis. And I ran up to him. He turned around. He looked at me with that Elvis smile. He had this inner glow. He was just like, burning energy. He put his hand out and said, hi, I'm Elvis Presley. Oh my God. I, said, wow. I, started <laughs> I probably would have fainted. What? I probably would have fainted. Anyone, everyone was. I said, hi Elvis, it's so great to meet you. My name's Larry Geller. And the minute I said that, one of his guys said, Elvis, they want you now, man. I remember him talking like that. They want you now. You're on. Come on, let's go. Now he just said, well, he shrugged his shoulders. You heard what he said, kid. Got to go. Talk to you some other time. And he walked off. And I just stood there. <laughs> in, I couldn't believe what happened. Wow. And strangers are coming up to me. They're shaking my hand. Some girl put her arm around me. I think, oh my God, this is something else, right? Now, to further the story, that made such an impact upon me. And my father was in show business back in the late 30s, the the early 30s, in the late 20s. He was in vaudeville, and he was a musician. He played harmonica, and harmonicas were very big back then. Yeah, they were. And he would tell me stories about uh, the Marx Brothers and uh, Eddie Cantor and Milton Berle and all these people he knew back then and played with. So I wanted to be in show business. But I had no talent, really. And I thought maybe I'd become an actor or something. So I graduate high school. I enter college. And my major was theater arts and English. And it wasn't working for me. So my best buddy, Christian, said, Larry, look, I know you want to be in show business, but that's very, very difficult. Maybe it will happen. Why don't you have something to fall back on while you're doing that? And you can make some money. You're very kind of good with your hands. You're artistic. Why don't you think about becoming a hairstylist? I thought about it. I thought it was a very good idea. I knew people in, the, in that business, and I spoke to someone. They said, go to school, get your license. I'll get you, you'll be working in Beverly Hills. So I dropped out of college, went to beauty college, got my license, and the minute I got it, I met this guy. Now it's 1959, June. And I was going to go to Beverly Hills and start working. I met a guy by the name of Jay Sebring. And that should kind of ring a bell. Yes. Uh, that, yeah, you, you know who he is. Mm-hmm. All right. And he said, Larry, don't 
become a woman's hairstylist. I'm opening a salon next week, and it's going to be the very first salon for men's hairstyling in America. It didn't exist. Got, we all went to barber shops for like a dollar, dollar and a quarter. They buzz your hair, you know. He said, we're going to shampoo the hair first. We're going to blow dry. We're going to do individual hairstyles. And we're going to charge $10, which was unheard of in those days. <laughs> That's a lot of money. We oh, so He said, we're going to be pioneers, man. We're going to be innovators. We're going to start an industry. I said, okay, I'm game. Let's do it. Right off the bat, our clientele grew so rapidly. We were doing the hair of Frank Sinatra, Marlon Brando, Steve McQueen, Roy Orbison, Peter Sellers, Glenn Campbell, Mickey Rooney. I mean, every star on television motion pictures, recording. I uh, remember Jan and Dean. That yes. group, yeah, they came to it. Everyone, Rod Hudson, Warren Beatty, Henry Fonda. It was unbelievable. I'm almost 20 years old, I'm making money. I, it was very, I loved it. It was wonderful. Five years later, I'm well established. I'm doing Henry Fonda's hair. Roy Orbison was one of my clients, Sam Cooke, Peter Sellers. And things were going very well. I was 24 years old. And one afternoon at the salon, my phone rang. I picked it up. And on the other end of the line, I heard the Southern drawl. He said, uh, Larry, I, we heard about you. And I'm sitting here with Elvis Presley. And then I heard that name. Wow. <laughs> Wait a minute. Yeah, I'm saying, <laughs> he said, I'm sitting with Elvis here, and he wants to know if you'd like to come up to his house here in Bel Air to fix his hair. Wow. I went back in the zone again. <laughs> I said, yeah, yeah, I'd love to. He told me where to go and I said, I'll be there soon. I packed my bags. I'll never forget, I'm running out the door. And the receptionist says, Larry, Peter Sellers is on the phone. He wants you right now. I said, tell Peter I'll call him later. I didn't care who it was. It could have right. been Moses. It didn't matter. <laughs> I, this is Elvis. What? Yeah, you don't turn that opportunity down, do you? Impossible. No. So I'm driving up to Elvis's house, and I can't believe what's happening. And uh, when I got to his street... I knew it was his house because there were tons of people in the front, young, old, every, every mi mixture of type. And I drive in and people are screaming, tell Elvis I'm here, tell him I love him. You know, all that, <laughs> and being, oh my, that was my first real taste of Elvis's universe. Wow. I walk in. And I look around, and I see Elvis sitting at a table with about five or six guys. He's wearing a, a baseball cap. And I don't know if you remember, uh, Marlon Brando wore this, ba this cap, and that baseball motorcycle cap from right. his movie, The Wild One. Mm -hmm. Elvis was wearing the duplicate. He said, I'll be right with you, man. I said, okay. And someone ushers me into the den. I'm looking around. And within 30, 40 seconds, Elvis walks up to me. The entourage is behind him. He walks up to me with that same inexhaustible supply of energy. And he puts out his hand and said, Hi, I'm Elvis Presley. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness gracious. But now, I'm six. Elvis was up about six feet tall, mm -hmm. and I'm six two now. I said, "Hi, Elvis. Uh, great to meet you." I, I, I didn't say a word. Not then. Later right. on, uh, not the first day either. 
I told him about when I met him and, you know. Right. So he said, come on, man, let's go into the bathroom. We'll talk to you, do my hair. We walk in and there's, and I expected to see a beautiful salon chair, you know, like right. most celebrities have and bulbs are on the, you know, tip of them. Mm-hmm. Nothing of the kind. It was just a very large bathroom and a little small sink. He said, come on, we'll do it right here. He put his head right in the sink. I put my <laughs> towel on them I, and I turned the faucet on and I'm doing, I'm being very, very careful. And then I'm rinsing it with my, I'm cupping the water and I'm rinsing it. I don't want them to get wet. And all of a sudden Elvis picks, rears his head up and starts shaking it back and forth. <laughs> and water splattering and it's hitting me. All of a sudden I see his shirt is drenched. He looks at me with that Elvis smile, that million dollar smile. He said, hey man, what the hell? At least it's clean. <laughs> I'll tell you something. When he said that to me, it's like I automatically knew who he was as a human being. Wow. He was so down to earth. Just like George and Dixon, just like, like you guys are. Wow. And some celebrities, names unmentioned, they want you to know who they are. Right. Yeah. All right. And there's veils and there's armor and there's the games, and, you know, the power trips. I could have been a gardener or a mechanic or a senator. Elvis treated me like a human being, like he treated everyone else. And I found this out later down the line. But in that moment, it kind of eased my nervousness up a bit. Because I was still very like, I was in awe of what was happening. And here I'm going to the studios in my life, and I'm working with you know the, the legendary Henry Fonda, Peter Sellers, Roy Orbison, wow. and all these people. Yeah. But this is Elvis is a notch above the rest. We're talking about something else. Because Elvis wasn't just the king of music, the king of rock and roll. To this day, no one has sold more records and albums than Elvis, more than the Beatles, more than the Stones, and Frank Sinatra, and Aretha, and the rest. Elvis is number one today, like he was then. But he was a major movie star. Yeah. Um, That's true. No one did that. No one did that. His movies in the 60s, although they were lighthearted, comedic, we know what they are. Sure. They gross more money than most other movies that are being produced. And his movies help Paramount Studios stay afloat and help other producers of other studios. All right. We sit down in front of this long mirror. And Elvis said to me, look, Laura, I'm in the middle of this movie uh, called Roustabout, and I'm working with the great Barbara Stanwyck. So you you can't take too much off, he said, because these scenes have got to match. I said, Elvis, just leave it to me, man. I, I, I know what to do. He said, okay, I'm leaving the driving to you. That's exactly what he said. Wow. So I start to do his hair. And I'm looking at, him, looking at him in the mirror, doing his hair, and I'm looking. And he's watching every move I make. Not a word was spoken for about 30, 35 minutes. And I figure, hey, if he wants to talk, I'm, I'm available. But I respect where he is, and I'll wait for him to make the first move. I do his hair. I dry his hair. I spritz it. And I'm looking at him in the mirror. I go, what do you think, Elvis? He said, beautiful, love it, great, great. And he spins around the chair. And I'm sitting right here, and he puts his finger like this. <laughs> <laughs> Who are you, Larry? Who are you really, man? What are you really all about? 
what are you really into? I remember when he, when I got that phone call a few hours earlier, it was a guy that used to work for Elvis, his name was Alan Ford. Uh, he said, uh, we heard about you. So Elvis heard something about me. And that's why he asked me that. Nice. And I could remember George and Dixie. I can remember exactly my thought processes at that moment. I'm freaked out. <laughs> I'm thinking, what in the hell is going on? I'm in Elvis Presley's bathroom and he's at, I just said this here and he's asking me. I got to tell him the truth. I'm going to tell him the truth. I have to. I said, okay, Elvis, I, I hear you. I hear what you're saying. Well, you know what I do for a living. And I have a lot of celebrities uh, that come to me. I go to the studio, I go to Vegas. But the truth of the matter is, what's more important to me than anything else in my life is my search for the truth, for God, for the purpose of living. Why are we here? Why does life exist? What happens to us when we die? Now, let me say this for a moment, you guys. We have to understand our culture, the time frame that I'm talking about. This is 1964. We're on the cusp, the beginning of the cultural revolution of the 60s. When everything changed, style, thoughts, religion, our way of living. And people didn't speak about these things. Subjects like this were almost verboten. Now, turn on TV and Oprah is interviewing someone, and this is all they talk about today. This right. is what right. we all yeah. talk about. There's been a spiritual awakening, but then, no, not at all. So I was very, very acutely aware of what I'm telling Elvis Presley, he was 28, I'm 24, and I'm telling him that I'm searching. I said, I read a lot of books, Elvis, spiritual books, metaphysical books, books about all the great religions of the world, Eastern, Western, ancient, modern. I'm a vegetarian. I meditate every day. I pray. And all of a sudden, I started to get very, very self-conscious. And by the way, if I'm looking down, because I'm looking at you guys. Right, right. Here, <laughs> I know, we, so, we do the same thing. <laughs> all right. So I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Elvis, I know who you are. You're the biggest star on planet Earth. This has got to sound corny to you. He said, whoa, whoa, man. Wait a minute, Larry. You have no idea how I need to hear what you have to say. Please, please, just keep on talking. I got to hear it. Go on. And I did. I told him about my background, being Jewish, how I grew up, and... I told him about myself and my questions, what I'm looking for. And he started shaking his head and said, man, man, that's where I'm at. That's where I'm at. Exactly. I have questions like you do. Let me give you an example. And he goes like this. Why was I chosen out of all the millions and millions and millions of lives to be plucked up? to become Elvis Presley. Why me? Why me? Is it an accident? Is life an accident? Is there a master plan behind everything? He said, Larry, you know, I'm a, I have a twin brother that was stillborn. I said, Elvis, I know all about your life. He said, his name was Jesse Garrett. What would have happened if Jesse would have survived? And it would have been him and I would have died. Would you be talking to him right now? What if we both survived? Would we be the Presley brothers? 
I have so many questions, Larry. Man, if you knew where I came from and where I've been in my life to get where I am now, he said, let me tell you something. I don't, I don't take my life for granted. I am so grateful every day I wake up. My life's a fantasy. It's a fantasy. It's a dream. He said, I was born in a wooden shack that my daddy built with a hammer and nails, a two-room shack. Back in 1935, we had no money to go to a hospital. I was born at home. Maybe if we had money, my brother would, who knows? Who knows? Only God knows. He said, man, you want to turn the light on and flip the switch? <laughs> Forget about it. We had no electricity in our house. No electricity, Larry. You want some water? You want a glass of water? You go to the fa oh, faucet. No, no, we had no faucet. We had a well outside. My mommy and dad would have to go outside with a bucket and bring water in. Oh, you want to take pee? <laughs> Out -out, <laughs> outside. That's where I came from, Larry. And this is where I am now. I have so many questions. And you know what blew my mind, you guys? I'm going to tell you. Most people that I've met in my life and have heard about and read about start searching for answers, for God, for whatever they're looking for. When bad things are happening, when someone dies, they lose a job, they lose a mate, or there's a sickness and they, they need answers. Here's a guy that had everything. Everything. Who is more handsome than Elvis Presley? I, I knew Rock Hudson and Paul Newman. These are the most handsome guys that ever happened in their prime. Elvis was, a, was more handsome than those guys. Yeah. He had everything. He had the, the hair, the eyes, the face. He looked like a King David out of the Bible or out of Greek mythology. Right? <laughs> he, he had more fans than anyone who ever entertained he was the perfect package, had everything, but there was a hole. And he knew it. That wasn't the answer to life. He said, I don't know how I got out of high school. He said, I'll sit there and just gaze out the window and visualize. I always visualize myself being on that silver screen. I wanted to be another Brando or James Dean and the and yeah, wow. he wanted to. So I, 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 I started to realize this has been going on for a couple of hours. Peter Sellers is waiting for me. I know that. That's my job. <laughs> you know, and I, I looked at him. I said, Elvis, I got to get going, man. Peter Sellers is waiting for me. He said, Peter Sellers. I love that guy. And right away, Elvis went into doing Dr. Strangelove. I don't know if you saw the movie. Oh, yeah. Dr. Yeah, it's a great Love, movie. Peter yeah, Sullivan. great movie. Uh -huh. Well, Elvis started imitating Dr. Strange Love, and he was great. Elvis, no, I never saw anyone do a better brand of than Elvis. He was really oh. a talented guy. <laughs> I said, I got to get back. He said, he said, Larry, I'll tell you what, man. I got a great idea. Why don't you do this? Yeah, go back to your salon and tell them that you're quitting and you're going to be working for Elvis. Oh, oh wow. So, oh, my gosh. That gives me chills. <laughs> and when he said that, he said, what do you think? I didn't have to use my, The brain didn't even click. <laughs> <laughs> brain, I didn't have to use said, Okay, yes, that. sir. Because, you know, when something's right, you know it. When you meet someone... And you're bonding, you're clicking, you know it. You know, it was so right. And I had, a, I had a future. I was supposed to be going to Palm Springs to open my own salon and be doing Kirk Douglas and Sinatra and all the people that live in Palm Springs. But when I was said that, I knew. And he said to me, and I said, yes. He said, you meet me tomorrow morning 
at Paramount Studios and bring me some of those books, Larry. That's what I want. So what he was doing, he was asking me two major parallel realities that converged. One, if you say yes, you're going to be responsible for the likeness and image of Elvis Presley in movies mm -hmm. and graphics and the, the personal everything. And I, I never took that lightly. That's like major. And as an aside, because I know the time is going by, so I'm going to get this in. Um, uh, I made, I did 11 movies, a lot of movies. Ralph's about Girl, Happy, Double Trouble, Paris, Hawaiian Stuff, Harem, Scarem, Spin Out, Clam Bay. Uh, um, you, you, all those movies, right? right? All, of them. all those movies, yeah. If someone has a very, very good eye, they'll notice that in every movie, I made her at least a little bit differently. Just a little bit. I have to go back and look at some of those. And it, it, for a reason, one, you see a more of a thing hanging this way and this and just enough to make him feel more comfortable because he hated making those movies. Yeah. And I'll, I'll get back. I'll get that in a moment. I'm going to squeeze a lot of things in real quickly here, okay? Mm hmm Yeah. All right. So he was asking me to be responsible for that. But what he was saying was more significant to him and to me. He was saying, I want to read those, what you've been doing, man. I want to read those books, too. I want you to tell me. Tell me what you know. Let's be friends. That was the glue that bonded us. Because Elvis was a searcher, like myself and so many other people today. To the, his very last breath, in fact, I brought him many, 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 many books over the years. We amassed a fabulous library. And several hours before I always died, I was at Graceland. I gave him a book. He died reading it. Oh, wow. Oh and the book is called The Scientific Search for the Face of Jesus. And his body was found on the floor in a fetal position with a book clutched to his chest. Wow, wow. That's crazy. How it all began. So Larry, I just just a couple of quick questions that I know some of our listeners are really interested in and I and I know your time is short, but I think you just answered one of them. Um I know for me, I would think that it's very upsetting for his family, these folks that are talking about um conspiracy theories that, oh, Elvis is still alive and all these Elvis sightings. And I would think for his close friends and family who knew him well, uh, that that kind of pulls at your heart a little bit. So what would you say to that? Dixie, I want you to know, of all the questions you could have asked me, that's the best. Thank you. Really. When Elvis passed away August 16th, 1977, I was with his father. <laughs> you know, no matter what I talk about with Elvis, I dissolve back into the to the emotion. That time, yeah. And his father said, and, and, and his father was standing there, and the funeral director, Robert Kendall, of the Memphis Funeral Home, and Vernon said to me, Vernon Presley, Daddy, mm -hmm. Larry, you have to go with Bob tomorrow at the funeral home. You have to take care of my boy. You got to take care of. You got to do his hair. You know how he should look. He wants. He would want you to. You got to do this. And I never did that before. Wow. I said, "Of course, Mister Presley. Of course, I will." Next morning, eight o'clock, I drove to the Memphis Funeral Home. I'm telling you, there were thousands, I don't know how many, I, I don't know, thousands of people outside this huge chained fence. 
and I can, in my mind's eye, I can, I can see thousands of people with their fingers holding on and people holding each other. And all I saw was people crying, older people, younger people, black people, white people. It was unbelievable. And it was like silence. And I drove in and there was Robert Kendall with a bunch of police officers and a guy that worked for Elvis, his good friend, Charlie Hodge. He wanted to come for moral support. And so they led me into this building and I'm walking down this long corridor. And at the end, I see a table and I see a sheet covering a body. And I know, I know what I'm, what's a, what awaits me. And I walk in and there's Elvis lying on the table with a sheet up to here, a white sheet. And I walk up to the, his, on his left side, Charlie's on his right side, and we just stood there for a long period of time. And I'm looking at that face. The beauty of that face. And one of my first thoughts were, that voice will never sing again. Oh. And he looked so peaceful. He really looked peaceful. And then the morticians took down his sheet because they were working on him with makeup. And now I have to do my thing on his hair. And I see the two X crisscross uh, from the autopsy. Right. And you know, when you know someone, you know someone. And I knew Elvis intimately because I did it air. And at the studio, we made three movies a year. And when we made a movie, I would have to do his hair four, five, six, seven, eight times a day. Because after every scene, we go back to the dressing room for a bit of makeup and for me to make sure the hair fit everything. Because when you make a movie, you could be do a scene now and the next scene is not in sequence of what you just did. It could right. be like a week later, right? So I had to stay on top of my game. At any rate, I knew every inch of Elvis. And you can't simulate a head of hair. Impossible. So I'm saying these things to let you know. It was Elvis. It was Elvis. And for anyone to say that is deplorable. Deplorable to say that Elvis didn't die. Exactly right. Now, the one thing that I... Pardon? Yeah, I was going to say, the one thing that I tell people, because they approach me a lot if I think Elvis has passed, and of course with our conversation several years back, uh, and I still tear up when you tell this story, but I tell them one thing that Elvis loved was his fans, and he would not do that to his fans. <laughs> oh man, you two guys are beautiful because you both brought up two of the most salient issues. So for any, and I, I'm going to address that in, okay. in a moment. So for anyone to say that is ignorant or they have an agenda. Right. And there's a lot of people that have written books and have said things. Why? Well, and maybe it's just the hope, the uh, still people in denial that he could really be gone. And, may, you know, maybe it comes well, from a good well, place. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. You nailed it. Because yeah. the truth of the matter is that Elvis does live through his music. Absolutely. Through the force of his personality to the, the corpus, the body of his work they left behind and through his fandom, who had more fans than Elvis Presley. Listen to this. We were in Oklahoma City on tour. I think it was 1976, somewhere in, you know, in there. And 
we were in the dressing room before Elvis was going to go on stage. Huge auditorium, 10, 15,000 people, whatever it was. I'm doing Elvis's hair, and I just finished, and blah, blah, blah. He's, he's got the jumpsuit. We're getting ready to leave. And one of the guys that worked for Colonel Parker walks in. Hey, Elvis, I got some great news. You know, he goes, yeah, lay it on me. He said, starting the next concert tour, they're raising the price of your tickets. And I said, oh, really? That's what you think. <laughs> no way. Wow. No way. No yeah. way am I going to allow that to happen. My fans, my fans have to save up sometimes all year just to come to see me. He said, wow. uh, no one knows more than me how hard it is out there. Life's a struggle. I'm here to entertain people. That's why I was born. That's my mission. That's who I am. I'm here to make people happy. When they come to my concerts, a lot of people come in, they want to be lifted up. They want to have an hour or two of happiness. That's all I want. That's why, that's what I do. And to raise, make it harder for them to come to see me, there's no way. Well, and Larry, I think that he does still do that to this day. I mean, I was born in 1985, I, you know, after Elvis had passed. And I grew up from a baby listening to Elvis. And I truly, truly love him. And I love his music. And to end up married to somebody that um, <laughs> is a tribute artist is, is amazing. But my girls are growing up on Elvis, my or our son too. But I will tell you, if I'm having a bad day, I still crank up Elvis, and it totally turns your day around. It's amazing. I love it. You know, the most frequent question I get is what kind of a person was Elvis? Yeah. You know, I could sit and tell you and tell you more and more this anecdote, that anecdote, that story, that event. You could read all the books. You could see the documentaries. But if you really want to know what Elvis is really like, don't read books. Don't listen to me. Don't listen to anyone. Listen to his music. Yeah. Listen to that voice. Listen to what comes out of this man, no matter what he's singing. Because no other voice in the history of singing has ever reached into the heart of humanity and squeezed it gently. Right. To all the emotions that come out, no one more than Elvis Presley. Uh, the, because that's the magic. That's where he's alive in that. That's alive in you. It's the spark of life. It's wow. Life. So let me end by saying this. The day, two days after Elvis died, the day after, he died Tuesday. Wednesday, I do his hair. We bring his body back to Graceland. Thursday is the, the funeral at Graceland. When the funeral is over, I was in the back room, lying in the casket, and all the guys are there, and his father, and the lid's going to come down. This is it. And his father screamed out, son, I'll be with you soon. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Oh. He died two years later. Oh. Mm. So Bob Tyndall said, I'm sorry, but it's time. He's, going, he's, put, he's starting to lower the casket. And I made a decision. And I'm standing next to his dad. I want to be the last person to touch Elvis. Wow. I put my hand in. I put it on his forehead. And I said something silently. I put my hand out. The coffin closed. Oh. And here we are. Wow. We're so, about it. Larry, you are, it, from the first time I, I talked with you several years back, I just fell in love with you. You have just a beautiful spirit. 
and such a kind heart that I know that not only with Elvis, but all those other people that you have worked with. And, you know, a lot of people will confess a lot of stuff to their barbers and their beauticians. And I'm sure you've right. had a lot that I'm sure that you were just a, an inspiring, positive force in their lives when they've talked to you about their issues. So I want to thank you so much for your time. Yes, thank you for coming on. You, you and Dipsy are, you know, the minute we saw each other, we had that same connection I had with yeah. Elvis. Good oh, friends bless you, no, forever. I appreciate God bless that. you guys. Is is there a possibility, real quick? Are you still there? I'm right here. Yeah. Okay. Is there a possibility that we might be able to interview you again to get in some other fun things about Elvis? Down the, down the line, let's do it again. Yeah. And then I want to also promote your book because this is an amazing book. I'm going to put a link on our Facebook page, Amazon. So we'll get it to everybody. Well, when next time. Next time we'll talk about your hair care line because you're amazing with some wonderful products. We have tons to talk about. And right. if you talk about Christine, send my love. Okay, very Thank nice. Well. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you've been listening to Dixie and the King. My name is George. And, of course, Dixie, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you so much to Cast Content Media for sponsoring this. And check us out on YouTube and our Facebook page and our website. DixieandtheKing.com. Right. And we will have um, a link to Larry's book on our website and Facebook page as well. That's right. Until next time, God bless. Thank you so much for tuning in to Dixie and the King. We know there are possibly millions of podcasts out there, and we really appreciate you landing on ours. We'd love to hear back from you with suggestions, episode ideas, and possible guests. If you'd like to connect to our guests, we would love to share their contact info with you. Feel free to tell a friend and share our podcast with them. To learn more and watch past podcasts, please visit our website, DixieandTheKing.com. 